So <clears throat> Uh, Laplace transform um, invented by Laplace in the 1800s. Um, so first, uh, in Laplace transform, uh, as you recall, uh, e to the st has a key role. Um, and so that's the uh, appears in the Laplace integral. Um, but it also serves a role as an eigenfunction of differential equations. And so if you recall, an eigenfunction is that special function that when some operation is done upon it, um, the uh, result of the operation has the same form as the original function and may be multiplied by some constant. So, of course, if you take the derivative e to the st with respect uh, to t, um, you, you end up with s e to the st. And so s would be the constant, but it still has that same e to the st form after taking the derivative, hence eigenfunction. Um, <clears throat> and so that's kind of a, a first thing. So the reason that we uh, perhaps motivationally choose to use Laplace transform um, is that uh, it's often an easier way to solve problems with differential equations um, than, it, than to uh, do them directly. Um, and so <clears throat> uh, one of the easy ways, of course, to solve a differential equation is the art of guessing, judicious guessing. And so if you just plug in e to the st, you can often solve them. Um, <clears throat> another thing to say is that it's implicit in a lot of your circuit theory. And so, of course, if you remember, if you have a capacitor, um, the impedance is 1 over sc. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> that kind of came through a lot of development in, circuit, in your uh, background in circuit theory, which kind of led to the use of the Laplace transform to come to this simple, uh, perhaps more simple representation of the behavior of a capacitor. Uh, if you recall, when, it, when you first learned capacitors, you probably uh, had the current equals C D V over D T. And so it was originally probably in differential equation form. And so I equals C D V D T uh, became uh, 1 over S C after you uh, learned to use Laplace forms. Um, <clears throat> so it has a huge role, certainly in circuit theory and, and many other applications. Um, and so again, this, this notion is it's these methods, basically Laplace methods, simplify the solution of differential equations. Um, you're most likely to appeal to the impedance of a capacitor as opposed to use the differential equation in day-to-day -day engineering use. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier later on, the Z-transform is going to be uh, a similar role uh, for the digital components of our control loops. And so uh, today uh, we're really talking about the continuous time portion. And uh, as is common in many, many uh, digital control systems, part of the loop is analog, part of the loop is digital. Um, <clears throat> our use, uh, so we're going to primarily use the one-sided Laplace transform, uh, but we'll mention the use of the two-sided Laplace transform too. Uh, depending on uh, textbooks or uh, your courses where you learn to use this, you may or may have used one or the other. Uh, just say real quickly, one-sided Laplace transforms the integral from zero to infinity, two-sided is minus infinity to infinity. Um, finally, uh, we're going to talk also about inverse uh, Laplace transforms, and so uh, partial fraction expansion uh, is probably one of the most common methods to do that. Uh, so again, we'll just review these uh, properties and uh, uses of Laplace. So, um, we'll start with the uh, one-sided or unilateral uh, Laplace transform. Um, again, uh, it's the integral from zero to infinity. Strictly, uh, it says uh, as you approach zero, um, as that's on approaches zero, and so it's kind of taken from zero minus to infinity, so just to the left of zero. Um, so this uh, allows an impulse or direct delta function at zero to kind of be included uh, in the 
uh, Laplace transform. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the forward transform is straightforward. Uh, the most common form uh, would be from zero minus to infinity um, of x of t e to the minus st. Um, again, recall that s is a, in general a complex number. And so it has a real part sigma and a uh, imaginary component omega. Um, omega is the continuous time frequency. And as is common in most digital courses, uh, we're going to follow the format that our analog frequencies are denoted by the capital omega. And the digital or discrete time frequencies will be uh, the lowercase omega. Um, that's a convention that's consistent uh, with most uh, use uh, in um, <coughs> digital signal processing textbooks. Um, and so uh, that since we're going to talk both in this course, we have analog components and digital components in every loop. It's important to uh, have a, a, a consistent convention where our continuous time uh, frequency is one symbol, so capital Omega, and our discrete time or digital frequency is going to be a lowercase. We'll discuss this more when we talk about Z transform and sampling and digital systems. Uh, so for now, uh, it looks a bit unusual, uh, but the capital Omega for the rest of this course will be reserved for our Laplace variable. So Sigma plus J capital Omega, uh, not the lowercase. Um, so the inverse transform um, is a integral uh, in a complex plane. Um, and so if you recall, when you do the Laplace transform, you plot um, the complex plane. And so uh, this sigma axis is the real part of S and the uh, omega, J omega axis um, is the imaginary part. And so in this complex plane, you do this integral for the inverse Laplace transform. Um, and so you choose some value of sigma uh, to do that integral. Uh, typically, uh, for uh, many systems, that could be the J omega axis, so sigma would be zero. But in some cases, if you have a pole that lies upon the J omega axis, you may have sigma be some small positive value. Um, I think we'll see that in a project later on. Well, you can numerically do this integral, um, but it requires complex mathematics. I'll point out one thing uh, in the integral. So there's the x of s, which is our Laplace variable. And instead of e to the minus st, we have e to the plus st. And again, it's a derivative of the variable s. And so uh, if you've had complex uh, analysis or complex mathematics, uh, you, you're familiar with how these integrals are done. Um, and they can be a little bit complicated. And so uh, the most common method, of course, is to use a lookup table. So once you do the forward transform, uh, you just look in a table to do the inverse transform. And so uh, that's the more common method uh, to do it. But you can also use other methods. Um, <clears throat> I believe uh, um, <clears throat> if you've taken complex uh, analysis, uh, you've probably seen uh, a little deep, deeper exploration of that complex integral. Uh, I'm going to kind of omit that for now. We'll just stick to the more basic um, features of Laplace. Um, by the way, just kind of mention again, Z transform is going to have much the same role. It's going to have a complex plane. Um, and also, if you recall for Laplace transform, you typically plot things such as poles and zeros in the complex plane, and they have an impact on whether a system is stable or not. Um, so uh, the Laplace transform, um, uh, just do a quick example uh, for a uh, one-sided Laplace transform. 
By the way, one-sided Laplace transform uh, is very commonly used because for most causal signals that uh, are zero uh, to the left of the uh, zero uh, to the left of t equals zero, uh, so they are causal. Um, the Laplace transform um, one-sided uh, is perfectly fine because there the, this integral is zero. Um, to the left of zero minus. And so <clears throat> the one-sided Laplace transform suffices for all causal signals. And uh, that's typically why it's uh, probably the most common in, in controls uh, analyses. Um, so for this example, let's choose uh, e to the minus a t u of t. So that's kind of the uh, form of an impulse response of an RC filter, if you recall. So if you had a RC filter, you would expect the response that looks of that form. Um, e to the minus ATU of T, of course, so this uh, would be uh, a damped, uh, or excuse me, an exponential decaying function. Um, so at T equals zero, the value is one, uh, and it decays uh, exponentially. Um, multiplying this by u of t cuts off right the, the left side or the before, time before zero. And so indeed, this is causal. There is no response before t equals zero. And so this would be a causal impulse response uh, of an RC type uh, filter. Um, so again, uh, being a causal signal, uh, the one-sided Laplace transform does not chop off uh, any non-zero values to the left of the function. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, computing this Laplace transform, so we plug in for x of t is e to the minus a t u of t. So we can combine these two exponents. And so we have e to the minus s plus a t uh, dt. Um, and so uh, this integral um, is uh, the uh, numerator divided by uh, S plus A. And so uh, taking the limits from uh, zero to infinity, um, we can see that uh, uh, if we split this up um, into uh, some pieces here, um, we have a, uh, a <clears throat> real part of S plus A um, that's going to determine uh, the decay um, so if we broke this into its two pieces, uh, this would look like e to the uh, minus, uh, taking the real parts. Um, so let's break it into its two pieces, sigma plus j omega plus a t. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> we can take the real parts out, which would be e to the minus sigma plus a uh, e to the uh, minus j omega t. Well, there's a t in the first part. And so uh, what we observe is uh, if uh, sigma plus a is a, a number that's greater than one, uh, excuse me, greater than zero. Uh, by the way, if sigma plus a equals zero, I have this becomes one. Um, if sigma plus a becomes greater than zero because of this negative out front, it's a decaying value. And so uh, where we really have interest to this is uh, if I look at the, the um, upper limit at infinity, what's important is what happens at infinity for this uh, first part because e to the minus j omega t, the magnitude of that is one. It's on the unit circle. Is at an angle equals uh, omega uh, t. And so uh, the magnitude really is determined by the leading term here. And so if sigma or the real part of S equals minus A, that's the boundary. And so <clears throat> for the real part of S greater than the real part uh, minus the real part of A, uh, it turns out that uh, that will be decaying. And so uh, this numerator, uh, the e to the minus infinity portion becomes zero. And all that I'm left with is substituting zero uh, for the other term. And of course, uh, at t equals zero, e to the zero is going to give me um, 
a magnitude of one. Um, and so <clears throat> uh, the value of the function becomes um, uh, one over s plus a when the real part of s is greater than minus the real part of a. Um, so what does this mean in terms of the S plane? So notice that the location, we have a single pole uh, in this at S equals minus A. So down here, I've drawn uh, the real and imaginary part of the S plane. And so we can see the pole down here at minus A. Um, and the region for the real part of S or sigma being greater than uh, the uh, value of A um, would be this region to the right. And so this region to the right is the region where the Laplace transform exists. Uh, to the left of that, again, that exponent uh, e to the infinity blows up. And so uh, we could say that the region where this is, where x of s exists, is to the right of the pole. Um, <clears throat> by the way, um, so that's kind of the last detail. Um, here is that when you do this integral, it has to be in a region where this x of s exists. And so here I've drawn a line of integration uh, where sigma is uh, out at some value sigma i. I can do the integral along this line for the inverse transform because it's in the region of convergence. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, <clears throat> The inverse transform now uh, could be used, uh, and we could do that integral, so using uh, complex calculus or doing numerical integration. And of course, uh, it will return the original function uh, x of t. So typically, we don't do that integral. We just make a table. Uh, one of the properties of Laplace transform, like the Fourier transform, is that the uh, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between each function x of t uh, and its corresponding x of s. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, we could use complex analysis, but uh, what we will use is the more common lookup tables. But as we're reviewing this, it's kind of uh, useful to take this simple example and point out a lot of these features uh, and review these features of the Laplace transform. Uh, by the way, um, notice that this region of convergence and the location of that pole means that the Fourier transform, which is uh, the Fourier transform, uh, occurs when uh, the uh, sigma equals zero. And so when s just equals j omega, that corresponds to doing the integral on the uh, imaginary axis for sigma equals zero. And notice that that's in the region of convergence, so that means the Fourier transform exists and is well behaved. And so we could also use the Fourier transform uh, to find x of t. Um, <clears throat> so again, uh, we could go, we could take a lot of examples, um, do the integrals, and then we make a table of the corresponding Laplace transforms. Of course, uh, the delta functions, the direct delta function, right? Height, infinity, area, one uh, at t equals zero. Unit step uh, is a step to value one at t equals zero. T u of t is the ramp function at t equals zero. E to the minus a t u of t, right, is the example we, we did. Uh, that's kind of the generic form of an RC filter. Um, and uh, we have more complicated functions down here. We could also have a cosine. I will say that this cosine only starts at t equals zero and sine starting at t equals zero because they're multiplied by u of t. Um, in general, when we're doing the uh, one-sided transform, uh, you can just say all your functions are multiplied by u of t. Depending on the pole locations, so let's just take a quick look. So the pole locations here is at minus a. This pole location is again at minus a at the double pole. Uh, this pole location here um, is a, a complex uh, pair of 
of poles. Um, and so this would be a J uh, omega zero. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, same thing uh, here for the other sinusoid. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> uh, different pole locations uh, correspond to different region of convergence. I'll just note here quickly, these poles are on the boundary. Um, and so uh, the poles are lying on the J omega axis. So the region of convergence is just to the right of the J omega axis. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, these are well-behaved functions. So it's easy to see that the damped exponential is a well-behaved function. And so uh, it has a pole that's in the left half plane, so a stable pole. Um, one other thing to point out quickly, um, so the U of T has a, a region of convergence that, strictly speaking, does not include the unit circle. So its pole location is actually at S, uh, at S equals zero. And so uh, in this case, it's strictly not stable. Um, and I can make the argument, this is not a bounded input, bounded output uh, stable uh, system because the, uh, the system that has an impulse response U of T, if you recall, uh, is a block that's a integrator. And an integrator is unstable uh, because if I put a step function, which is bounded function at the input, the output of the integrator becomes a ramp. And a ramp is unbounded, so it's strictly speaking not BIBO stable. We can see that because uh, it, its pole is not strictly in the left half plane. It's on the J omega axis, so it is unstable. Um, so uh, there is another transform, and this may be uh, one that you learned uh, in previous courses. So it's a two-sided or bilateral Laplace transform. Um, we typically don't, uh, we won't be using this one. We'll be using the one-sided transform, but it's uh, important to kind of review it. Um, it allows non-causal functions, X of T. Um, and so uh, it's not restricted to uh, analysis of signals that uh, are zero for time less than zero. Um, however, um, there's a bit of a price to be paid um, so that when you find whatever X of S using the two-sided um, or bilateral Laplace transform, you also have to include something called region of convergence. And so uh, that region of convergence is the uh, area that we were talking about. Uh, if you recall the example where we had a pole, uh, the J omega and sigma axis, axes were here. We had a pole at minus A. And the region of convergence, or the region where the Laplace transform existed, was to the right of that. Well, you must have a region of convergence in addition to X of S uh, to have a complete bilateral transform, because there will be two different functions that have the same X of S, and you must state the region of convergence to make, make them unique. Um, by the way, we'll see the same thing when we talk about two-sided Z-transform, but uh, again, uh, the textbook that uh, we're referring to and the notes, Amazon book notes, uh, primarily use one-sided Laplace because uh, principally in controls are interested in causal response systems. Um, so just briefly, uh, the main difference is uh, it now, instead of starting at zero, starts at minus infinity. And so you can have functions that are non-causal and two-sided transform. Um, but uh, just note real quickly, you must include a region of convergence so you can distinguish between uh, two transforms that have the same X of S. So now that particular type transform will state very clearly what X of S is and what the uh, region of convergence, the area where the function exists. 